Hello there, and welcome to an episode of This Week in Stupid Misogynist 2. Basically, I have such a backlog of articles related to sexism and misogyny that it would take me two months to cover them all if I did them only once a week. So I'm doing a couple extra episodes every week to get through my backlog. Also, I've noticed that anti-feminists tend to find this content slightly irritating, which is another reason for me to bring it out more often. Many anti-feminists are invested in the idea that women have achieved equality in the West, so the fact that this show even exists is a counterfactual to their narrative. Before we review the five articles I've chosen to highlight this week, I'm going to address some comments that I got on the last video. From Jimmy, is there a reason we cannot like or dislike this video? Yep, Jimmy, that's because I want people to use their words to respond to my content. From Jared, good video, but I don't really think that in today's society, being a man is more valued than being a woman. Sure, a few years ago, I'd be right there with you in agreement, but you can't really deny how much advocacy women's rights have been receiving lately. Well, Jared, what I would say is continue watching the series, because you'll see the same problems coming up over and over and over. If women were really valued on par with men, we wouldn't see the same problems reappearing. From Shoe on Head, nice 1998 window screensaver aesthetic. True, although my series does not have the aesthetic of, say, a stock background upon which I've pasted an animated suit of armor, I would say that it's more advanced than following the instructions from WikiHow on how to pose like a model from the majority of my thumbnail poses. Now let's move on with this week's double helping of sexism and misogyny. This episode's theme is attacks on American women's reproductive health care. Psst, Jared, this is the sort of thing I'm talking about. Trump's pick to oversee federal family planning program doesn't believe birth control works. Politico reported that another anti-abortion activist is set to take on a prominent HHS role, Teresa Manning. Manning, a law professor who's worked for two anti-abortion groups, the National Right to Life Committee and the Family Research Council, will reportedly be named Deputy Assistant Secretary for Population Affairs. Manning will be in charge of doling out the $286 million traditionally allotted to the Title X Federal Family Planning Program, which helps provide close to 4 million low-income Americans with basic health and family planning services. During a 2003 media tour to promote a book she'd edited about the future of the anti-choice movement, she called family planning, quote, something that occurs between a husband and a wife and God, and it really doesn't involve the federal government, according to The Guardian. And in an interview with Boston's NPR affiliate, Manning suggested she doesn't believe in birth control. Quote, its efficacy is very low especially when you consider over years, which a lot of contraception health advocates want to start women in their adolescent years when they're extremely fertile, incidentally, and continue for 10, 20, 30 years. The prospect that contraception would always prevent the conception of a child is preposterous. Manning has also claimed that the link between abortion and breast cancer is undisputed, there's no evidence linking the two, and is called abortion, which is a constitutionally protected right, quote, legalized crime, unquote. There's first the issue that she doesn't understand probability. Um, and I could do a whole episode probably on that, unfortunately, but uh, I don't have time. So I'm just going to focus on the theme of this episode, which is I honestly don't get the obsession that right-wingers have with controlling other women's fertility. They are willing to spread outright lies. Their constant attacks on Planned Parenthood are basically pathological. And they have no interest in women's health, maternal health, or helping families control their sizes so each child gets the resources that child deserves. And this sort of government-backed attack on women who want to control their reproduction is not limited to the federal level, as we'll see in our next article. Oklahoma Republicans passed bill requiring state officials to call abortion murder in public statements. Oklahoma lawmakers have passed legislation that would require officials to consider abortion to be murder. The Tulsa World reported a law was passed Monday afternoon that would force any state official to defy the U.S. Supreme Court decision that legalized privacy for the procedure. This was also done without any discussion or debate on the House floor. The bill's author, Republican State Representative Chuck Strom, spoke after the bill's passage, claiming the High Court violated, quote, every act of decency and law, unquote, when it decided Roe v. Wade. 
He declared the following documents of the United States were abused by, quote, forcing the murder of unborn children in our society, unquote. Strom insisted the 10th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution mean, quote, no one, not a doctor, not a father, or a mother, has rights that allow them to murder an unborn child, unquote, and the Supreme Court didn't have the authority to decide the case. Now, the cognitive dissonance here makes my head hurt. On the one hand, Strom is saying that the constitutional amendments declared embryos and fetuses legal persons, which they didn't, and also that the Supreme Court, the one that's mentioned in the Constitution, doesn't have the authority to decide the case. Well, if SCOTUS doesn't have the authority to decide it, then who does? There is no one else charged with interpreting the law according to the Constitution. Of course, what Strom probably means is his God. Because of what he thinks his God wants, he and his GOP buddies are going to use the power of the secular state to control the language around a legal medical procedure that he personally doesn't like. That is what an encroaching theocracy looks like, folks. Another way that especially Republican men attack abortion rights and access is to paint the women who get abortions as irresponsible, heartless, and incapable of being trusted with making their own medical decisions. For instance, Alaska State Rep is confident that women get abortions for the exciting travel opportunities. Representative David Eastman, Republican Wasilla, is sure Alaskan women are running a con with this abortion business, declaring in an interview, quote, you have individuals who are in villages, and they are glad to be pregnant so that they can have an abortion because there's a free trip to Anchorage involved, unquote. Eastman said, We've created an incentive structure where people are now incented to carry their pregnancies longer than they would otherwise and then take part in that when they wouldn't otherwise be doing it. When asked for evidence, Eastman said he certainly knows of specific instances and declined to provide details. Quote, I can think of a case that was brought to our attention earlier this session where you had a family who was very glad to hear that their abortion had gone beyond a certain point because they were going to be headed to Seattle, Eastman said. What utter BS. I mean, this guy is obviously making things up. How would he have come to hear of such cases? You think women are phoning up his office saying, Ha ha, I'm 17 weeks pregnant, and I'm so happy to get a trip to Anchorage to get an invasive, painful medical procedure that will end this pregnancy. Whee! What fun! Pathetic. You know what this sounds like to me? A guy who's repeating a rumor about a woman that people don't like, and he's repeating the same idiocy to a newspaper. And this guy gets to vote on the laws to regulate women's access to health care. Seriously? And this sort of contempt for women's sexual health is reflected throughout society. Even though anti-feminists want to say that women have achieved equality in the West, I can't think of a single instance where a man has had his medical prescription refused by a pharmacist. Can you? Pharmacist who has pretty good idea why girl wants birth control won't fill prescription. Last August, a woman went into a Walgreens store in Albuquerque, New Mexico, to pick up some prescriptions for her daughter. One of them was for misoprostol, a drug that prepares a woman's body for the insertion of an intrauterine device, also known as an IUD. Jesse Garrett, the pharmacist on duty, filled the other prescriptions, but not that one. They had the drug in stock, but he said his personal beliefs prevented him from giving it to the mother. When she pressed Garrett and his manager for some more information later, Garrett's response was unbelievable. Mr. Garrett explained in a judgmental tone that he was refusing to fill the prescription because he had a pretty good idea for what purpose the medication would be used. Mr. Garrett's statements left MS with the sound belief that he was refusing to fill MS's daughter's prescription because he believed the prescription would be used for MS's daughter's reproductive health care. It was slut-shaming by a pharmacist who felt his religion was more important than a doctor's prescription to a patient. Walgreens later told the mother that they had retrained all the pharmacists in the area regarding what to do in those situations and what to say. He added that their current policy, if a pharmacist didn't want to fill it for personal reasons, was to transfer the prescription to another pharmacy. That went against what Walgreens had said in a similar situation years ago, when they promised they would handle prescriptions for things like birth control, quote, as efficiently as other prescriptions without imposing any burdens on the customer, unquote. The ACLU and SWLC sent a letter to the New Mexico Human Rights Bureau stating that this is also a clear-cut case of sex discrimination. 
refusing to fill prescriptions that are directly tied to the attributes that make women different from men, that is to say, the ability to become pregnant, constitutes sex discrimination. It's inconceivable that the same denial of service would have occurred if Mr. Garrett had assumed that the medication would be used to treat stomach ulcers, the only indicated usage for men. In other words, had the patient been a man rather than MS's daughter, it is reasonable to assume that the prescription would have been filled at this location without delay. I don't need to say too much about this, I don't think. The bottom line is that this man's job is to fill other people's medical prescriptions. It's not about him. He is just the dispenser. He's not the doctor, and he's certainly not qualified to morally judge anyone. This is yet another example of a man who wants to control women's sexuality, hiding under the guise of religion. Women are his customers, and women should not feel like they will be viewed as sluts when they go to get their prescriptions filled. They shouldn't have to go to a different store because some man-child was too focused on his own fifis to do his freaking job. And personally, I think Walgreens should fire anyone who refuses to hand over a prescription because that employee is making assumptions and moral judgments of their customers. And quite frankly, we should be celebrating the fact that contraception has made life so much better for everyone. This article in the New Republic discusses how vital the pill is to the American economy. President Donald Trump pledged during the campaign that he would roll back a regulation issued as part of the Affordable Care Act that requires contraception to be covered without copay in insurance plans. The rule had angered religious employers who objected to, they say, being complicit in providing birth control to their employees. The Trump administration is reportedly undertaking a sweeping change that will allow virtually any employer to wriggle out of the mandate. There would be no requirement that they find another way to provide contraception, such as through a third party. Trump's reversal would thus risk any employee's free coverage and potentially put them on the hook for hundreds of dollars a year. Without the mandate, thousands of employers could quickly rescind the benefit. States will not be outdone by the federal government, however. The Missouri Senate just approved a bill that includes a provision rolling back employee protections in St. Louis for women who use contraception, which was tucked alongside a number of other attacks on reproductive rights. The legislation would make it perfectly legal for an employer to fire or refuse to hire someone because she uses birth control. The authors found that more than 30% of the increases in women holding jobs was thanks to the pill. Another paper gets even more specific. Legal access to the pill before women turned 21 both increased how many women were in the labor force, as well as how much they actually worked. Access to the pill reduced the likelihood that a woman would have a baby before the age of 22 by 14%. That, in turn, increased young women's labor force participation by 7%. The women who first had legal access to the pill because of their state's laws worked 650 more hours than their peers who only got it later. The benefits of all this work experience accrue to the women themselves. The women who had early access to contraception made 8% more by the age of 50 than the others. The pill is responsible for about a third of the closure in the gender wage gap that was achieved by 1990. But the benefits also accrued to everyone. Between 1972 and the early 1990s, the share of women in their prime working age who were in the workforce rose from 72% to nearly 84%. Had that not happened, the economy would have been about 11% smaller in 2012. So no, women have not achieved equality in the West. We have people, mostly white Christian men, at every level of government trying to undermine contraceptive and abortion access. These attacks are not just in the form of official laws. We saw how legislators slag off women who access abortion services. And we have seen how those attitudes were behind the man thinking he could refuse to fill a woman's prescription because she might go out and have a bunch of sex with it. Fact is, we have a long way to go to reach equality. And the rate at which I am finding articles for future episodes of This Week in Stupid Misogynists is further evidence of that. But until then, all that's left to be said is that I've been Christy, you have been awesome, thank you so much for your time and attention, and you and I will be seeing each other again very soon. Bye bye A special thank you to my patrons, 
These are the people who make the Resistance Fund possible, and also who are responsible for the increased production value and microphone quality that you're enjoying now. To protect their identities, I give my patrons a secret agent name. So to all of my secret agents, thank you so much for your support. <laughs>